And thank you, OGTC, for giving me this opportunity to come uh, today to talk to you about marketing and what's that got to do with manufacturing. Well, I'm just about to show you. But, but first, uh, it's going to be a two-man job today because we've got a bit of a tech problem. So my able assistant, Ronnie, is actually going to be doing the, uh, the work on screen, and I'm just going to be talking from my Apple and let's start with Apple, uh, because what have these, what have these brands got in common, ladies and gentlemen? Um, Apple computers, shampoo, Coca-Cola, and some of you may not know the the one in the bottom left-hand corner. That's a Japanese low-value uh, clothing brand called Uniqlo. Uh, well, I'll tell you what they've got in common, because um, what Apple have done. Uh, when you think about the products, and I'm a complete um, advocate of Apple, as you can see with the, one of the two Apple computers I brought with me on this trip to India. Uh, what they've done is changed the face of how we uh, consume music and consume entertainment nowadays. Um, they, and also, they make beautiful, elegant products that not only are functional, uh, but look wonderful in our homes. So that's Apple. Coca-Cola. What have Coca-Cola got to do with Apple? Well, what Coca-Cola do before they move into a new territory is slightly change the recipe of their product in line with the market research that they've undertaken. And America likes it sweet, Europe likes it less sweet. So they satisfy the needs of the territories that they operate in. Even though we all think we're, we're drinking a Coke and a Smile, we're actually drinking a slightly different recipe of it, depending on where you are in the world. And then Dove. This, this product, if you don't have it in your own market, is just a, a supermarket, a standard, fast-moving supermarket brand, a shampoo. But what Dove did was actually change women's perceptions. Uh, you know, all the ladies in the audience and maybe some of the men here today. Uh, you know, we look at all these perfect people on the covers of magazines and inside magazines, but it actually makes us unhappy because we'll never achieve that perfect look. So what Dove did was start a viral online campaign uh, debunking um, the thought, the, the way that we perceive uh, beauty and showed a fantastic video, which is still available online, about all of the fakery that goes on after a photo shoot with a beautiful woman has happened to make her even more beautiful, to the point where that beautiful woman becomes less than human because they elongate her neck to such a point that if, it was, if she was a real person, her head wouldn't be able to be supported by that long neck the giraffe neck. And it had a profound effect on how the way women um, thought about um, the fakery that goes on. Um, and then Uniqlo. The first time Uniqlo entered the hugely competitive UK market in the early 90s, uh, what they set out to do was undercut Gap. In fact, they, they look like Gap. They're in that, that same sector. Uh, but what they didn't do was research the market, and they actually closed operations in the UK. Move forward to 2010, last year, Uniqlo are now um, have got prestigious visual merchandising awards for their Paris stores, and I opened the Vogue when I'm flying over here last week to India, I opened a copy of Vogue, and they're actually advertising in Vogue. This is a value retailer advertising in Vogue. They've also got one of the world's most prestigious designers working for them, Jill Sander. Um, you know, to attract somebody of her quality, um, a, a designer I always aspired to but could never afford, um, that takes some doing. And of course, finally, the one in the middle, the one that we all dream of having that same business model as. Zara didn't advertise above the line advertising. What did they do? They produced fantastic fashion. Um, 
And of course, they've got the business model where if something's not selling on the shop floor, that intelligence goes back to the product and development and production um, departments of Zara, and they can change very rapidly. We all dream of being like that. But when you think that other retailers in the UK close down their vertical operations, like Laura Ashley and Jaeger, and these guys come in and do the exact opposite. I know they're not all vertical um, in their operation, but it works. It can be seen, of course, by, by the, um, the highest first day opening figures in Zara's history when they opened in India. And what have they all got in common? Bit of tech problem here. What they've all got in common is trust. We trust these products not only to perform well, but to look good and to make us feel good as well. And they're reliable. They don't break down. Or if they do break down, it's a seamless operation to take them back, like I did recently with an Apple product, and was given money, cash, dollars. Um, you know, sorry, here's a little bonus for you. And they corrected the problem as well. And they're consistent in their operations also. Consistency over a long period of time. And of course, they're innovative. And what does this lead to for all these products, for all these brands? Profit. And one last one before I get on to the actual in main introduction today. Um, this is a company that I'm sure a lot of you don't uh, know, but um, Middle England, middle class, uh, do. It's a department store group and a supermarket group. And they have become the most trusted brand in the UK, trusted more than banks, trusted more than politicians, which is quite easy to do in the UK nowadays, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, but trusted even more than Marks and Spencers, and they were the, the market leader in trust for many, many years. And why is this? Well, because the way they behave towards their customers. No other retailer in the UK treats its customer with such care and attention. They smile when you walk through the door. They're well informed. So they're trusted, they're reliable, they're consistent, they're innovative in what they've done with both their supermarket and their department store brands. And it leads to profits. But the interesting thing about John Lewis also is that those profits are shared with their workforce. No matter if you're the floor sweeper or you're the CEO. And by the by, ladies and gentlemen, the CEO of this organization is paid one of the lowest salaries for any CEO for a department store group in the UK. But he's happy to go there every day to do his job. And also, the workers are not called workers. Everybody is an associate, from that floor sweeper up, up to the CEO. They're all associates. And what does this do? This means that they feel a sense of community and no one is better than anybody else. There's no sense of them and us in this organization. And how has it been achieved? It's been achieved by using effective marketing principles and practice. When you think about it, the most successful global brands out there make marketing their, well, their highest priority. Um, place it above everything else, marketing, marketing, marketing driven organizations. Be why? Because a marketing driven business works better and more effectively than one without. And I'll give you an example of this. Um, I've, I've supplied Marks and Spencers for a long time and I'm still just about one of their customers. But before 2000, Marks and Spencers didn't believe in marketing. They didn't know what a window in a store was for, apart from rolling up the garment rails and backing them up into the window. Um, they sat on their hands. They had a big chunk of the UK market, but they sat, sat smugly on their hands. Why Next started to expand operations, so not only in high streets, but in out of town spaces. And then of course, that pesky Zara entered the UK marketplace. And everybody in the UK, like we had done in India, have embraced that brand. And all the time, Marks and Spencers know we don't need 
uh, a marketing department. And what happened? Share price began to tumble. The city began to grumble. And so nowadays we've now got um, a marketing department and one of the most iconic Christmas advertising campaigns year in, year out um, that, than anybody on the UK high street uh, featuring supermodels, featuring um, pop stars, pop idols, and it works. So, I finally come to the beginning of the uh, presentation. Utilizing marketing principles to counter competitive forces. And the key points I'm going to look at are front-end activities here, customer-facing skills, and the resources that you need to do that. Um, and of course, due to the time available, um, I'm not going to concentrate on your lean, mean production machine at all. This is purely front-end marketing I'm going to look at today. And why, sitting there in the audience, do I need, if I'm a manufacturer, to know about marketing? Marketing is something done behind closed doors, as I was told quite recently. No, it ain't. Uh, and why you need to know is you've got a growing com competitive uh, marketplace out there. Um, three years ago, uh, myself and my UK team were tasked by um, Asda Walmart for their George clothing range to investigate Africa as a future uh, manufacturing base. And, uh, and that's what we did. I was quite surprised at the time because I thought, no infrastructure in Africa. How, what we're going to do in Africa. But slowly but surely, whilst I've been over here the last uh, few months, um, I've noticed more and more articles on uh, production in Africa, not necessarily for clothing at the moment, but for other products. And where other products lead, clothing will follow. Uh, and also, last October 2010, I was involved in uh, training um, some of your Chinese competitors' merchandisers um, in Hong Kong. Uh, these merchandisers don't even meet um, the UK and American consumer, uh, the ones that their company were producing merchandise for. Uh, not at all. But what their um, company wanted the merchandisers to know was how the consumers in those two countries behaved as shoppers as fashion shoppers. So think about it, they don't even come into contact with them, but they come into contact with their um, equivalent at their uh, buying offices and they can talk in a more informed voice to those buyers and buyers assistants and buying office merchandisers. So that's what your competitors are doing from overseas. Also, of course, you know, my um, colleague mentioned earlier on um, that the, the two key markets America and the UK and Europe, Europe being part of the um, UK being part of Europe, um, massive downturn, economic gloom and doom, um, and there's worse to come according to the media. So what next do you do after you've shaved every penny, cent, rupee off your prices and you're still tearing your hair out because you can't get that business? Marketing. Let's look at marketing and what does it actually mean. Is marketing just about selling, as people quite often say to me? No, it's not about selling at all. I've been in the business for over 30 years and I've been lecturing on fashion marketing for the last 11. And how I describe it from all that perspective of being in the industry since sewing machines were steam powered, um, is it's about attitude. It's actually about attitude more than anything else. You can read all the marketing books that you like, but if your attitude throughout the organization isn't changing, um, they're useless. And the attitude, not only towards your customer, but in everything that's done throughout the business, uh, from how teams interact with each other and don't play the blame game. Well, they should have done it. No, you should have done it. Um, their attitude towards the business and their attitude towards what they're producing. You know, having, taking care and understanding that that thing they're putting under the foot of the machine is actually going to produce a profit and pay their wages. 
Um, I, I was told a story quite recently by a friend of mine about a factory she visited, and they were actually walking over white t-shirts. They were using the, the products that they'd just made as carpets, you know, because they didn't understand the value of those items that they were producing. They had no relationship with what they were doing. There was a complete disconnect. Um, and the way they think about themselves within the organization, and governing all this, of course, is the attitude of the management towards them. So selling is only one of the many principles of marketing. There are many more. And what is the difference between selling and marketing? When, well, selling, as I know, because I've done it, is persuading or influencing a customer to buy and keeping that mouth of that production fed day in, day out. Compared with marketing activities which support the sales effort and marketing occurs not only during when you're doing that negotiation but before and after. How? Because marketing activities anticipate what the customer wants even before the customer knows how to do it. I've trained thousands of young buyers now um, and I, I know what their attitude is. The customer is not always right. Um, when does the customer want it? How much they want it for? How many they'll want? And getting it to them before the competition. And it's not just about the sales. It's particularly important to think about communication with these customers. No, the next one. That's it. That'll do. The true story of a buyer and his supplier's merchandiser. Buyer, buyer email. Please can you urgently let me know when we are likely to get the photo samples for the black lace shoot. Need to know now, need to now include in September 4th issue of Mail on Sunday, which is a very uh, popular uh, paper that have a very good um, fashion magazine um, that's available on Sunday. Merchandiser, response, duly noted. No communication, that was it, duly noted. Duly noted what? Am I going to get it or what? So communication or lack of. So, activities involved in marketing. Are we forward or back? Press it forward and see where we are. Yes, activities involved in marketing, and obviously we're short of time, I want lunch and I know you do. So what am I going to look at are the, are the areas of marketing that have asterisk, put a little star against. Research analysis, communication, anticipating your customers' needs, and over and above all this, a marketing orientated mindset or philosophy adopted by the whole business. So market research and analysis. The market sector you're operating in has to be researched. Um, your customer, but also not only your customer, but their customer. What's your product offer? How often do you analyze your product offer? Um, your resources, particularly your human resource, certainly your competitors, and of course that big wider environment and ask yourself, how often do I or we do this? Now, a nice little interesting story here about what happened this week. I've been to Bangalore this week and to Mumbai, um, preaching uh, trend forecasting to the uninitiated. And the, question I, the first question I asked the audience out there in those two venues was, how often do you uh, go out into the marketplace? Oh, we do, we do, all the time. And then actually when I press them and say, well, how often is often? Well, I go to London, I go uh, take the family to London once or twice a year, I send my two teenage daughters to Topshop and New Look, and I tell them, oh, get daddy some winners. Uh, that is not market research, it's just a holiday. Um, so it's, it has to be often, it has to be consistent, and it has to be regular, done on a regular basis. And failure to research, um, this is the result of failing to research, uh, ladies and gentlemen. This was the notorious C5. 
um, that was brought out by the gentleman who's actually driving it in the 1980s. And it became an instant joke, an instant disaster for somebody who, who up until then uh, was a, a, a genius. He's, he's actually Sir Clive Sinclair. Uh, but unfortunately on this occasion, um, Sir Clive was just too arrogant to believe his idea wouldn't work. Can you just imagine driving that through the streets of Delhi on a hot summer day? He didn't undertake research about what was happening in his market because he was ensconced in his uh, chauffeur-driven limousine, reading the FT back, back and forward from his home to his office every day. He didn't actually look what was happening around him. Uh, certainly when I saw it, I just thought, oh, de instant decapitation in the traffic of Manchester. Uh, weather conditions, it rains an awful lot in the UK. It did eventually come out with a plastic cover, but without uh, wipers. Um, and also, unfortunately, Sir Clive at that time surrounded himself um, within his organization with a culture who were reluctant to challenge anything he said because he was the, he was the main man, he was the boss. So, but the results, if you do research and do it often, better informed, you and your team will be better informed and it will provide an improved service to your customer. Um, certainly we'll fight off the competition and that's what I'm here to talk about today. Improve your operation because you'll be better informed about markets, about these competitors, about opportunities out there. Um, hopefully to increase sales and hopefully to in, improve profits, but certainly to enhance uh, relationships. But not only with your customers, actually with these people, the important people, your workforce. And if you do become a more successful company, pass that success on, not necessarily financially, but praise your workers. They're not just, it's not a them and us scenario. And it hasn't been a them and us scenario in Europe and the States and Japan for a long time. Happier management mean a happier talent pool. Happier talent pool, more productivity. Is this a too simplistic uh, description I'm giving you? Have you tried it? Um, and I know what you're going to say. I've not got time, we've not got time. So, are you saying, in other words, you don't have time to invest in your future success? Because failing to plan is planning to fail. Because maybe it's not the quality of your products uh, that could be improved. It could be that they're becoming the wrong types of products for your customer. It may be that your customer needs to be convinced by you because you're much better, got more knowledge about the market, um, that they need to change the products in line with current or future uh, market needs. And as I said, having worked on both sides of the desk in a buying office, as a buyer and as a supplier, the customer is not always right. And your key resource, your key resource, your talent. And I'm not talking about your own talent, I'm talking about your talent pool that actually work with you and work for you. These are not my words, ladies and gentlemen. These are, talent, these are words from talent management texts, but they are very profound. The key enabler of any organization is talent. The quality of your people is your last true competitive differentiator, and talent drives performance. Talent management. Now, here's, I'm getting to the crux here. Do you invest in talented people? Do you positively encourage them? When I walk past that Apple store in, on Fifth Avenue, or in Boston, or in Seattle, um, or in Regent Street in London, what do I see? I see it packed, absolutely packed when the malls are empty, the clothing shops are empty. So I go in and then I, I see a team of people late in the evening, chatting, smiling, happy. The staff, they're there. So when I first saw it, the day after, I went in and asked one of the staff, what were you doing last night at 10 o'clock? Were you having a party? So he said, no, this is what we do every day. We reflect on our day and there's no finger pointing. We tell each other what we've done well during the day and we tell each other how we can improve for tomorrow. 
This is one of the global brands, don't forget, one of the leading brands. So there's no, you did it wrong. It's all about what, how can we improve. And you can take these tips and tricks from these global brands and use them back in the factory. Because fear freezes teams. So, do you actually give them the opportunity for training, coaching, mentoring? I've still got a mentor, um, and think about how long I've been in the industry and how old I am and experience. I still need a mentor to talk to about things that I'm, I'm worried about. Um, and it works. Um, it gives you a positive feedback. Does your team bring new ideas or do they rely on you? And if it's the latter, I'm afraid, it's either the wrong team or the wrong management because everybody should be pooling their ideas together. And this is a view from your competition. And this is the CEO of the younger group. Um, I know we're short of time, but so if you want to just have a look at the last two lines, we hope that within 10 years we can train more than 100 designers to help younger evolve from just making clothes to creating clothes. And so please take note that this company is not passive. It's not just making CMT. It's thinking about its long term, in fact, a 10 year long term plan. And understand that China now are not just producing um, for the West, they're actually producing their own branded goods. And those branded goods with added value are coming to a shopping mall not far from you, it very soon. So change, how can you change using these principles? Well, there's two ways of looking at it. Differentiation of your service, initiate rather than respond. Don't be the passive partner in your relationship with your buyer um, or your clients. Don't just talk to one person, don't just talk to the boss all the time. Talk to people lower down the chain of command. Um, speed. Ensure that you get things done speedily and, and responsiveness rate. <laughs> Remember the um, Julie noted. Um, so, and availability for communications at all times and make it easy, easier to do business with you. And the term Julie noted needs dispatching to the trash can of business terminology. And change using marketing principles in your product offer. Offer what your buyer has asked for, but then offer them something more. And I'll get to how I used to do it. Offer something new. Offer it more often. Offer more than expected by your customer. And make your customer delighted. When I walk into a John Lewis store, I'm delighted and I might not even buy. It's just the environment and the people who are there that make my shopping experience delightful. And if you can't get to your customer every week, which I was fortunate to be able to do because I was only 200 miles away from my customers, they were in London and I was in the Northwest, um, get an intermediary or even just get Skyping. So the benefits for your customer, a more reliable and innovative supplier because you've re you're researching systematically and constantly. Consistency. You're going to do this thing consistently, offer them new things consistently. You're going to build up trust because of this, and you're certainly going to have better communications. And for your business, you're going to have a more loyal, reliable, motivated, and happy workforce. Um, and I'm going to quickly tell you about my own experience, because as you know, I've been in it a long time. And the most happiest times, the most creative times, the most creative times have been working for small companies with massive rivals like Dewhurst, Cora, Carrington, Viel, and the Sterling Group. We didn't stick just to seasonal collections. We took something new into our customers every week, and they became to expect it. Um, develop new components all the time, constantly developing newness. And of course, we learned a lot from those big boys because we were aspiring to be them, but on a much tinier budget with a much smaller team. But we saw, our customers saw that we were keen to do business because we'd be enthusiastically taking new stuff in every week. And we demonstrated our consistency by doing this. They expected us to be there 200 miles from 
our base every week. And we did get more business. And because we were visiting our customers in a capital city, in a fashion capital, it gave me time, after I'd visited the customers, to nip into the shops, get inspired, see what our competitors were doing, and offer something slightly better for next week when I was going in. So, I'm going to try, I think there's only three more screens. So the results. Company share price rose 200% in two years at one of the organizations I worked for. We certainly increased our product sector from children's wear to boys wear to men's wear to girls wear. We even got a movie contract or offered a movie contract, not me personally, but the character that um, um, Time Warner wanted us to start producing merchandise for, we were given an opportunity to produce it for them. And um, a TV contract also, um, again for a character that I'm just about to show you. And even a British Fashion uh, Award nomination for a product I made for Marks and Spencers. And what did that lead to? Profit, profit, profit. And this gentleman, some of you may recognize, that's Mr. Saeed Jaffrey and myself. I am not the one with the whiskers that is tickling the ear of. I'm actually behind him. And this was one of the um, products that Granada Studios, Granada Television in Manchester, asked us to um, get, um, take part in and start producing merchandise uh, for them. So from a very small organization, we grew just because of those um, simple things that we did. And I say simple, they were simple. So to conclude, ladies and gentlemen, stop selling, start marketing. Small increments, but use a time plan, use a time scale. But rethink, if you're the boss, if you're the boss man, rethink your attitude before that of others. And stop thinking of um, your team as me and them, them and us. Um, competition can be reduced, but the magic formula is in the hands of your talent pool. Encourage their improvement all the time. Um, and I know that some people say to me, if we educate them better, they'll, they'll scarper, they'll go. Well, we've been educating them and giving them training courses like I went on when I first started for many, many years. You will lose some, but think about how much it costs to train people and the, um, the problem with staff retention if you don't. So thank you for listening, ladies and gentlemen. And just one quick quote from uh, Milen uh, Kundera, a philosopher and writer, who he says, business has only two functions, marketing and innovation. Thank you very much. Um.